Have you noticed that DaVinci Resolve is coming out with new features so fast that it's honestly hard to keep up? But here's the thing, not all of those features are the kinds of features that you use on every single project. So I've been digging through Resolve and I've found some genuinely useful new tools for audio, for color grading, for editing, and just the whole process in general. So here's what we're gonna do. Instead of just showing you features in isolation, we're gonna talk about five specific tricks that I use on literally every single project. Well, actually it's six tricks because there's kind of a bonus trick at the end of the process that's gonna save you a ton of time as well. And the best part is that we're going to do it while actually working on a real video that I'm making. So you'll see these tricks in action throughout the entire editing process. That way you'll understand not just how to use them, but also when and why to use them. And you might pick up some other stuff along the way as well. So secure the cup and let's get into it. All right, so here's what I did. I filmed this quick skit in my studio where I'm playing both characters, kind of making fun of myself for how I always talk about loving the grip on Canon cameras, in this case, the new R6 Mark III. No script, just me being ridiculous and pretending to throw the camera across the room to prove my point. I did a basic rough cut already, throwing the clips all together. So now we've got the skeleton of a video, but it's pretty rough at this point. And with that quick nonchalant setup that I had, come some issues. For example, I completely forgot to turn off some of the electronics that are running in the background. So there's an annoying kind of hum or buzz in the background of all the audio for the entire time. So the first trick that we're gonna use is one that's going to help completely clean up that annoying background noise. Voice isolation. Voice isolation being built into Resolve is one of my absolute favorite things that they've added recently. The idea is simple. It listens to your audio, it identifies what is voice and what's background noise, and it isolates just the voice. Here's the thing about voice isolation. There are two different places that you can actually use this. You can apply it to the entire track, which would mean that every clip on that track would get the effect, or you can apply it to individual clips, which gives more control if some clips are noisier than others. And to do this, we don't even need to leave the edit page. I know the Fairlight page can be a little bit scary for some some people, so you're welcome. To add voice isolation to a clip, we need to select that clip, open the inspector, and turn on AI voice isolation, then dial in our amount. But in this case, I'm actually going to apply it at the track level, which is usually the fastest way to go if all the clips on the track are from the same source. To do this, you can click next to the audio track name in the blank space, or in the inspector, there's a button to switch between clip view and track view. Then it's the same thing as it was with the clip. We're just selecting AI voice isolation and dialing in our amount. Now, a quick tip on this, most of the time you don't need to max it out at 100%. In fact, if you do, it can sound a little bit unnatural, almost like the dialogue is kind of sucked in a vacuum. So what I usually do is dial it in somewhere between 15 and 30% for my studio, but it's going to depend on how much background noise you're actually dealing with. I mean, yeah, but like, don't knock it till you try it. I mean, yeah, but like, don't knock it till you try it. The more noise you have, the higher you'll need to push it, but start low and work your way up until the balance of getting rid of enough noise while maintaining a natural sound is where you want it to be. Now, before we jump to the next trick, I wanna preface it by saying that normally I would do color grading much later in the process, but one, I'm a bit of a weirdo and I love color grading, so I kind of end up doing it early a lot of the time. And secondly, there's actually a really important reason why we're doing it now which you'll understand in a bit. So let's get our color grade started and I'll show you the next trick. The color warper. All right, so at this point, I've already done some basic grading to the footage, but I wanna tweak the colors a bit more to really make them pop. This is where the color warper comes in. It's kind of like HSL curves, if you're familiar with those, but in a way that's way more connected and visual. Now, there are a bunch of different tabs in here, but the one that I use the most is the hue saturation one. The way that it works is pretty straightforward. Out and in is saturation. So moving it in and out on the grid adjusts how saturated a specific color is. And then around 
around the circle is the hue. So moving it left or right is going to shift the actual color itself. And if you highlight a point on the grid, you can also dial up and down the luminance of that specific color point. Now, here's my personal workflow for this thing, the kind of thing that I like to do a lot of the time. First, I'll change the amount of color slices and saturation points to 16 and 16. This gives me way more control over the colors that I'm working with. The way I typically like to use it is to create some kind of color contrast by creating kind of a squish shape, almost like an oval where the skin tones and the blue are the most saturated. To do this, I grab the outmost points and I either move them in to desaturate them a bit, or I move them closer to one of those two colors, orange or blue, or kind of a combination of desaturating and moving towards those colors. This is my cheeky way to kind of mimic a two-toned emphasis that we see in so many films. But then I also like to tame any skin tones that are too saturated by pinning that kind of mid-saturated skin tone level and then dialing down the most saturated parts a bit. I can actually use the picker to find the point where I want to lock the saturation in. As I hover over the skin and find that point, it'll highlight on the warper so I can lock that one point down. This is nice because I won't be blowing out any color in the skin or making it look unnatural, but I'm keeping keeping it more natural and controlled. And that's the color warper in action. Now here's the thing. Remember I said that there was an important reason why we were doing the color grades so early? Well, I've got this empty gap in my edit and I need a transition in there. And that's where the next trick comes in. But first, I'm gonna need to fill in that gap to make my idea work. This video is sponsored by Artlist. So I've been seeing everyone doing these cool transitions between two clips lately, and I absolutely needed to try it. In case you're not familiar, Artlist is a super easy to use, but expansive all-in-one platform where you can get things like music, sound effects, stock footage, templates, and more for your videos. And lately they've been diving into more of the AI voice, image, and video generation stuff too. But for this specific app, we need to use some of the new AI features. So what I've done is exported the last frame of the video before the gap where I'm throwing the camera and then the first frame after the gap where I'm catching the camera. I didn't actually throw the camera. I'm gonna choose the Kling 01 model, upload those two frames, and prompt it to create the transition between them where the camera is flying through the air. This is a really specific ask for it, and it definitely takes a couple of attempts to get it to do what I want it to do, but I'm also going to modify this a lot to my needs once we get the footage back into DaVinci Resolve. Once I've got something that I think will work, I'll export that, I'll pull it into Resolve, and now I'm going to cut just the parts that I need color match if necessary, and then speed up that clip so it looks like the camera was thrown really quickly. And this is actually why we need to color grade the footage first, because the AI generated transition clip needs to match the frames before and after it. Now, before I close Artlist, I'm gonna grab a whoosh and a smack sound effect for the throw of the camera, and maybe some kind of like silly background music for the whole video. And at this point, I've got pretty much everything that I need for this video all from one place. If you wanna check out Artlist and get the best deal for your all-in-one package, use the link down in the description. Huge thanks to Artlist for sponsoring this video. Now, we're pretty close to being done with this transition, but there are a couple of things that I think we could do to really sell it. It's not quite feeling right yet, and that's where our next trick comes in. Search effects. All right, so the next trick is one that's gonna save you so much time when you're editing. It's called search effects, and you access it by hitting shift and space. What this does is it brings up a search menu that allows you to automatically add things to your timeline or to clips without ever having to dig through all the effects menus. So let me show you how I'm gonna polish up this transition. First, I'm gonna hit shift and space, and I'm gonna start typing adjust. Then from the options there, I'm gonna choose adjustment clip. This creates an adjustment clip above all my clips that I can apply effects to. I'm gonna trim it to the length of the transition so it only affects that specific part. And now I'm gonna hit shift space again to start typing direct, and I'm gonna choose directional blur and add that effect to the adjustment clip. This is gonna create the motion blur for the whip pan effect that's gonna really sell the motion of that camera flying through the air. I'm gonna change the settings of the directional blur so that it's going side to side with the whip pan, and then I'm going to keyframe the amount of blur so that it increases as the movement happens and it goes away afterwards. And playing it back, 
looks pretty good. Now, I wanna add one more thing with our shortcut. I'm gonna to go to the start of the entire timeline where I'm looking at the R6 Mark III. I'm gonna hit shift space again and type text plus, and then add a text plus, which automatically populates on top of the current clips. I'll type in Canon R6 Mark III, change the font, gradient, faded in and out, all the things that I might want for that text. So now we've got the transition looking great and we've got our title in there, but there's one more thing that we need to do to really make that title more interesting, and that's our next trick. Magic Mask. All right, so to take that text to the next level, we're gonna use the magic mask to place it behind me. First, I'm gonna cut the part of the video clip where the text will actually be, and I'm gonna duplicate it above the text by holding Option and dragging. If you're on a PC, it's probably Alt. So now the text is sandwiched between two versions of the same clip. One's gonna act as the background, and one is gonna end up just being me. Now, we can use the magic mask either in the Fusion page or in the Color page. Page, but let's do it in the color page this time because everyone wants to avoid the fusion page as much as possible. So let's choose the top clip in the color page and add a node at the very end of our node tree. Right click anywhere in the node area and choose add alpha output. This is gonna make it so that it cuts me out when we do the mask. We're gonna connect the blue alpha out from that last node to the blue alpha output. Now on that last node, we're gonna go to the magic mask tab and I'll start to click on my face and on my shirt and then I'll hit shift H to highlight so I can see what's selected better. I'll just click on everything that I want to include and option click on anything that I want to exclude. Now up in the top of our viewer, we can choose to see the black and white alpha mask and we can fiddle with some of the magic mask settings to try and clean up our lines a little bit. Next. Let's Let's hit the track forward and back and it'll track it throughout the clip for us. And then there was this one little tricky bit that I ran into with this clip was my glasses. So I had to go to all the frames where it kept screwing up the mask and option click to subtract the background through my glasses and then keep retracking it every time. And then after a bit of work, we have a pretty clean mask and we can hit shift H again so we can see the whole thing. And we have our text sandwich looking nice and clean. The background in the back, text in the middle, and the subject on top. So that's the magic mask in action, creating this awesome effect that used to take hours to do manually. Auto subtitles. All right, so now that we've got the visuals looking great, let's make sure that people can actually understand what we're saying. Once we're done with the edit, we'll go to the timeline menu, we'll choose AI tools, and we'll choose create subtitles from audio. I like to choose one character per line and this tries its best to separate every word into its own subtitle. Once it's done, we wanna go through and check that it did a good job. And honestly, it does a pretty solid job most of the time. Now that whole creating the subtitles isn't really new, but this next part is. So let's go to effects, titles, subtitles, and there are a bunch of animated presets. So we can drag a preset onto the subtitle track and now we have an animated subtitle from one of those presets. However, you're kind of limited with those presets, so I personally like to do a custom one. So I'll drag the simple white onto the track, which is not an animated preset, but it is from that same menu. And then I customize the font, the color, and everything else in the inspector under the track tab. Now, this is where it gets cool. I'm gonna click the button to open in Fusion. This only works because I've loaded one of those presets. On the template node, we're gonna go to the layout tab in the inspector. On the first frame, add a keyframe for size and change it to something like 0.7. On the third frame, add another keyframe and change the size to one. Then I'm gonna open the spline editor and click zoom to fit. Highlight both keyframes, right click the second one and choose easing and Outback Cubic. Now the animation of the size is going to slightly overshoot full size and bounce back into place. And if we go back to the edit page now, we'll see that every single subtitle is now doing that same animation. So we just created our own little automated animated subtitle. It's a pretty cool way to make your subtitles feel custom and polished without having to animate each one individually or being stuck with those default presets. But we're not quite done yet. I've got one more bonus trick that I use all the time and it's going to save you a ton of time if you're someone who likes to repurpose your video for different platforms. Bonus trick, easy ratio switch. All right, so this bonus trick used to only be available in the cut page, but they've now added it to the edit page, which is 
awesome. First, let's find our timeline, right click it and duplicate it, calling it something like vertical, and then open that new timeline. Next, in the top right of the viewer, there's a button with a down arrow that has some common timeline resolution settings. I'm gonna choose the portrait 1080 by 1921. And boom, we just converted our whole timeline to vertical and we just need to tweak a couple of settings either in the timeline or on the clips. So the way that I'm gonna do this is I'm going to right click on the timeline in the media bin. I'm gonna choose timeline, timeline settings, and then under mismatch resolution, choose scale full frame with crop. This makes it so that the clips take up the full frame so they're actually filling all the space. Now we can go through and reframe anything that we need that fell outside of that vertical frame. And just like that, we have our vertical version of our little skit. No re-editing, no starting from scratch, just a quick duplicate and a couple of setting changes. So that's five tricks plus the one bonus that I use on pretty much every video these days. If you have any questions about these tricks, drop a comment down below and I'll do my best to answer. If this video helped you out, please like, subscribe, and hit the bell notification so you don't miss out on future videos. If you want some more DaVinci Resolve tips, there's another video coming up right here somewhere soon, so click that and check it out. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Man, have you had a chance to try out the R6 Mark III yet? No, I haven't had a chance yet, but what do you think? I don't know what it is. It's just something about it is just like... <laughs> Let me guess. You're going to say the thing that you always say about Canon cameras. The grip is so nice. It feels so good in the hand, right? Yeah, okay. That was exactly what I was going to say, but like, don't knock it till you try it. See? That does feel really good, right? Oh my God. I told you, 